the longest detainees there. Can you say the names again? So, yes. This is Fazal Naim. He is the brother of detainee Fazal Kareem. Fazal Kareem is actually uh, mentally uh, ill. And throughout his captivity, he's been kept in Bagram for in solitary confinement for over five years. Um, and he's one of the longest ones in here. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, of mine, did he get to give you a So his name is Gulshir Khan, and his cousin is Amal Khan, who has been in Bagram since Kapsa Bagram. 2000, 2002 as well. Wakil Khan. Wakil Khan. Mera beta Amidullah. Two thousand eight. Inka beta. Oh, sorry. You don't speak or do. His son Hamidullah has been missing since two thousand four and was only fourteen years old when he was taken to Bagram. Wow. Ah. Umar us kate. Twelve years. Twelve years. Jee, maine bataya. Fourteen years old. Uh, he's one of the youngest uh, in Bagram still, um, and he's been there for a very long time. What's his son's name? 2004. Uh, Hamidullah. H-A-M-I-D-U-L-L-A-H. We actually have press packets with the detainees, so we're going to hand those out to you guys. Um, Umran, by the way, is our volunteer. Um, he just arrived from France. He's going to spend a year with us. We're not paying him, and he's just working on the background case. So, Ron, can you run and get that? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but now, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to He is also the brother of Fazal Kareem. So, these uh, Fazal name and Fazal. Uh, Mama Desag, sorry, are brothers. Um, Siraj. Siraj or? Or कब से वो 2005 से okay so this gentleman's name is Siraj his brother is a detainee his his brother's name is Umran Khan and he's been captured and in Bagram since 2005 2005 by Umran Khan और कब से 2005 this is Abdul Razak his brother Amanullah who was actually picked up by the British forces in Iraq and handed over to the Americans who oh. then rendered him to Bagram. Um, and he's been, he was captured 2000, 2005? Since 2003. And Amanatullah's case is, uh, is one of the cases that were pre-filed uh, in the British High Court as well to sue the, uh, to sue the British government for violating, you know, their agreement with the United States by rendering a British, uh, by rendering Amanatullah to the Americans who then took him from Iraq to Bagram. But that might be like legal stuff that bores you. I don't know how. Do you get bored by legal stuff? Most people do. Good. It's good to hear. Um, so if you guys want to ask them any questions, Umran's just going to bring the blurbs and you can read a bit more and see the pictures of the detainees. But aap in se kuch kehna chahte hai? जी मैं इनसे कहना चाहता हूँ मेरा मैं भी आपको बताया मेरा बेटा घर वाइफ को ये रात को एक बजे पाप देखा पाप देखा चिफ्ट चिफ्ट तरह चिफ्ट तरह मैं वो सारा फिल्म हो गया उन्होंने बोला मैंने बोला क्या हो गया बोलते हैं बग्राम में आग लगी तो मैंने बोला यहाँ से आग तो आप नहीं बजा सकते क्यों बोलते हमारा मैं घुरा जल गया तो पूरा रात फिर हम लोग देखते रहे वो रोती रही रोती रही एक आंख का बिना ही उस पर गया तो रोज़ जाना हमारा घर का ये गाल His wife has been fasting ever since her son disappeared and she fasted for कब से आपका बेटा क्या था? 2008 Since 2008 she was fasting every single day and then she developed chronic health problems and developed very poor eyesight um, and he said that two days ago, on October 2nd, sorry, his wife woke up in the middle of the night and they, um, Bakil's family lives in Karachi. They, they emigrated um, from South Waziristan when the military operations began there and they relocated to Karachi. And Bakil works as a, a night guard at one of the factories. Um, when Hamidullah was lost um, and his wife started suffering all of you know the health problems that she had, Two days ago, she just uh, had a nightmare and woke up in the 
small place where they live with all their children as well and said that I dreamt that Bagram was on fire and our son had burnt down. And she's been inconsolable for the past three days um, because she believes that her, her son is lost forever. All of you from the bottom of his heart for coming here and uh, you know meeting them and hearing their stories. Um, he says that since the time his brother has been in Bagram, his father has passed away um, in, the abs in, in his son's absence, and their, their mother has become severely ill from sorrow as well. Um, and he hopes and prays that when you guys go back, that you can tell their stories and help get their, uh, you know, their relatives and their their brothers out. And he wishes you guys all the luck um, to help them succeed and help you guys succeed in your mission. that they're not they're held without trial mm -hmm. and whenever they speak to the detainees to their families um, through the ICRC uh, video conferencing uh, they get a call once every two months um, which they have to travel for uh, you know from Karachi to Islamabad for the call and sometimes it doesn't go through most of the time it doesn't go through um, their their family members tell them that you know we, the Americans are telling us that we're going to be released soon but years and years go by and they don't know anything and they don't hear anything and nothing changes and that's one of the central problems with Bagram and you know this uh, review procedure that the American government has set up because you know, they say it's gotten better after Obama. Um, well, it's really far from being, you know, anything that would be recognized internationally as any court. Um, and like Vakil said, you know, if my son has committed a crime, charge him, try him. He's been there for longer than five years. If you commit, you know, any act of terrorism or anything like that, you know, he would have been out by now being a juvenile. Um, but they're ho they continue to hold him indefinitely. Um, and don't tell anybody, including their lawyers, who we are, we, we've not, we can't meet our clients. We're not allowed to go to Bagram. Um, and, you know, they don't really talk to us. We try really hard to speak to them. Um, and he also wants to thank you guys uh, for coming here. He says that he will never, ever forget this moment. And he will, you know, he wants to thank you from the bottom of his heart. A quick... Take a will be with um, Actually, the... the MOU that was signed between the American government and the Afghan government back in March related specifically to, thir uh, to Afghan detainees. So oh. Afghan nationals at Bagram <coughs> were to be transferred to Afghan custody, but there are around 52 third country nationals, out of which 37 are Pakistani nationals. Um, and they were explicitly left out of the MOU. Oh. So even with the handover that took place on September 9th, um, there were 3,000 prisoners, Afghan prisoners, that were transferred uh, to Afghan control, although after the Afghans set up an administrative detention regime, which again is uh, a present that the Americans kind of you know, gave to them, um, and it violates Afghan law as well. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, Hamid Karzai has recently said that it's not constitutional either the detention regime um, and that handover was problematic as well because it did not address um, it was just a very superficial measure to push things ahead which were the other strategic partnership agreements that were coming up um, and they left out 
uh, a very important part, which was that the U.S. was still <coughs> going to continue to capture people in the field and detain them at Bagram. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you read all the articles that were published and the Open Society report that came out in September on the 6th or the 9th, the OSI oh, report, they, they specifically raised this issue of how this transfer is not really a transfer, it's kind of a reboot of Bagram because in the time that they signed the MOU in March till the time of the transfer in September, the U.S. had captured and processed over 600 Afghan prisoners uh, who, again, are still at Bagram under U.S. control. Um, so that's a really big issue that's still taking place. But as far as third country national and Pakistan <coughs> detainees are concerned, nothing. How many you Could you say what an MLU is? Sorry. That when they did transfer them, I thought there were hundreds that were the, the, you might be thinking of the Afghan prisoners that were transferred. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's the Afghans that were transferred from U.S. custody to Afghan control. And they were still. And there's still 600 so more that. Kept, kept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about the the so ones? Let's raise our hands, everybody. Yeah. I think Chelsea had a question there. Okay. Um, I was just wondering the total number of detainees there now. Uh, you mean Afghan and third country nationals? Yeah, like total. I think. I mean, after they they turned over 3,000, there's 600. 600 left and around 52 TCS. 52, 52. So as far as we know, um, there's 600 who have not been transferred, who were picked up between March and April, uh, March and September, and around 52 third country nationals. But, I mean, that's excluding the 3,000 that are transferred but are still at Bagram, just the Afghan side of Bagram. Right? What was that number again? So 3,000 transferred under the MOU, um, 600 captured after the MOU was signed um, and still in U.S. custody, and 52 third country nationals. Did the memorandum of understanding say that the U.S. would not... And the other thing is that it's been about 11 years. It's been about one year for me. So it's been a lot of time. The whole family is very frustrated. آخر اس نے ایسا کون سا جو ہے جو کتنی سزا ہو کہ باوجود اس کو چوڑ نہیں ہے He's saying his brother is one year older than him and he has spent 11 years in indefinite detention and his whole family is just heartbroken because we don't understand what he's done and what he's being punished for اگر یہ لوگ ہمارے پرائم منسٹر سے ہماری ریکویسٹ کر سکتے تو بڑی مہربانی ہوگی ان کی کیونکہ ہم لوگ تو نہیں مل سکتے <laughs> he's pleading if you guys can meet the Prime Minister of Pakistan because he would never, they would never meet him. Um, and he's asking you guys if you can try to meet the Prime Minister and raise the issue because the Prime Minister seems to be in a very, very far place and he's allowed access to Or other in case of Prime Minister, if they can help us, then we can request that we can and he's asking for you guys to go and raise this issue with your head of state as well um, because they're desperate for help. His brother today, and we've scanned it and we've translated it, and we'll just read it out to you. Um, his brother has written over 200 letters through the ICRC to his, fam uh, to his family, and he's kept every single one of them. Um, the, we, we talked about this earlier today, and... Um, they were telling us about their recent conversations with their loved ones, uh, with the detainees, and everyone agrees that in the last uh, couple of months, the conditions have definitely worsened. Uh, the detainees were on a hunger strike over the summer. Um, they are um, being subjected to increased amounts of pressure, um, and they've, they've, all of them actually, in their conversations with their families, have said that the detainees are saying that uh, conditions are getting worse. Um, just to give you an idea, they keep the Pakistani detainees in one big cage, um, kind of like you would keep livestock, I guess, and even that, you don't keep livestock like that anymore, right? Um, if this, and because there's most amount of them are Pakistanis, so they're, they're, they don't have enough space. Um, when they sleep, they sleep, you know, right next to each other, and it's incredibly crowded. And for 37 people, there's only one toilet, um, and it's public. Um, so they have no privacy um, to wash themselves or go to the toilet. And when they go to the toilet, uh, a couple of other detainees prop up mattresses to afford them some privacy. 
um, but they have to use the bathroom in front of 37 people. Um, because the detainees are Muslims as well, there's been some concern uh, because there's so much distrust with the American guards. Um, they've lost a lot of weight recently because they have been refusing to eat meat because they're not told if it's halal or it's not. Um, and they've raised this issue repeatedly. As far as we know, even the Pakistan, they've raised it with the Pakistani um, embassy and the Pakistani embassy has assured us that they've raised it with the Americans, but the Americans have not budged on it at all. And so what the detainees have started doing is they've stopped eating the meat because they don't know if it's halal and that's causing them to lose a lot more weight. So it's issues like these. Um, and for example, for Fazal Karim, who's been in solitary confinement for five years, um, the situations are absolutely horrible. They described what a what the solitary uh, confinement cell was like. Do you remember? Uh, so it's it's basically a three by three cell with uh, it's there's no transparent window, so you, can, you can't see anything. No light comes through. Nothing at all. And uh, so if he lies down, he can if he stretches his hand, he can touch the you know the, the commode. So and that's basically that's the extent of his cell. So he has to eat in front of where I mean his bathroom basically. Three by three means three meters by three meters. Three yards by yeah, three, three yards. Meters. Um, yeah, three meters. No, not two feet. That I'm not sure. <laughs> Does it mean three meters? Or two? No. It's um. Three we've three seen three pictures yards. of it, so it would be kind of the, the length of this sofa coming out like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very very small. And don't they have that window up yeah, top with the, the guards? Yeah, and the American guards walk on top. The, um, so you're literally in the ground, place. and the only window is up top and all you see are the boots of the guards walking up and down mm -hmm. um, and you have from uh, sleep deprivation and one of the things that I've never heard of well, I mean it's particular to Bagram is that they put you in extreme temperatures mm -hmm. so they keep they put you in a cell for you know a month or two months and every detainee goes through it um, and they have around two feet of water that you're constantly oh. in for that amount of time um, just to disorient you and make you incredibly comfortable and keep in mind that people like Hamidullah and other kids they're not treated any differently than the adults they're kept with the adult prisoners they're subjected to interrogation methods and you know lengthy interrogations and these are kids who are 14 15 16 um, and they've basically grown up there um, so that's what they we have that letter do you want to read it out would you guys like to hear the letter just so he, the detainee's name is Amal Khan and he wrote a letter to his brother and his mother so he's so he says, um, dear brother and mother, uh, assalamu alaikum. Um, thanks to God's grace, I am doing fine. And I hope that thanks to God's grace, you are also doing well. Um, he then lists an, a lot of uh, a number of his um, uncles, um, children, and he conveys his salam to them. And uh, then he says, don't worry about me. I am, I am happy, although I'm less happy than I used to be. The, the U.S. guards are treating us a lot harsher now, and uh, things are getting tough. And um, then he says, "I pray to God that He grants all of us freedom." That's that's it. That's the exception. Well, any time the bag when they the, and the two things that they're not allowed to talk about when they speak <coughs> to their families or write to their families is how they were captured, how they got to be in Bagram, and what the conditions are like. If they write or speak about any of these things, then they are punished. And the punishment could range from not being allowed to be on the next call with their family to being put, you know, to, to harsher methods like solitary confinement. So it's very difficult to get any information about the detainees and what actually goes on there. And since January, um, since the new commander came, uh, the American U.S. commander came, um, most human rights organizations have not been allowed in either. So the last one that I know of, um, the last time anyone was in there was in, um, in January. 
hockey that we represent. He's also Chris very mentally ill. He's got a whole history of mental yeah. illness um, since you know he was a juvenile. Uh, and yeah, um, yeah. his charge is suspected. Well, we say charge. It's not a legal charge. Um, this is what the sheet that we were forwarded, which is just an Excel sheet mm -hmm. in which they put the detainee's name and what the Americans are saying no. that we're trying yeah, to do is a, an IED manufacturer. Now, this man is uneducated and is a day laborer um, who couldn't, you know, yeah. hold a train of thought for longer than, um, you know, a couple of minutes to the maximum. How he can manufacture IEDs is absolutely beyond us. Um, so it's, it's, it's charges such as those. Now, we don't know what evidence the United States has when they've captured them, because that evidence is not disclosed to us or the families. Um, and that's one of the essential differences between Bagram and Guantanamo Bay. Lawyers are not allowed to go into uh, not allowed to go into Bagram. So the whole process um, and the whole experience of these detainees, to some extent, is shrouded in mystery, right? For the families, for the detainees, for us as well. We never know what's going on and when is it going to end. So.